Good morning, everybody. All right. Rob Baldwin here, um, attorney in Florida. I help get and keep our clients' legal affairs in order. And it has been one week since our last socially distant seminar. I'll say that three times fast. Um, last week, we discussed, I discussed a bit about estate planning. And we discussed how estate planning is really broken up into two parts. Um, one is death planning, but it's not just about death planning. Uh, the other is incapacity planning. Last week, uh, I spent some time on the death planning, as I said, wills, trusts, probate. What is probate? How can I avoid probate? Why do I want to avoid probate? We discussed a little bit about that. Um, and because of the questions and comments that I received from you, uh, this week I will be talking more about incapacity planning, which is equally as important, some would say more important uh, than the death planning portion. So why is this important, incapacity over death? Um, you are statistically more likely to be incapacitated next week than you are to be dead. So that leads us into uh, what are the things that you should do or what are the appropriate measures to take ahead of that um, being your situation, ahead of incapacity, when and if. So typically when people think of um, guardianship, which is something that we'll be talking about today, uh, guardianship, uh, you usually think of minor children or um, godparents, things like that. Uh, but guardianship applies equally to adults, uh, incapacitated individuals here in Florida. So I'm going to be uh, talking primarily about guardianship and powers of attorney here in Florida. As I said, that seems to be what um, the viewers wanted to hear more about as last time we had talked more about the death planning. So just like last week, I prepared a uh, some slides here to go along with my discussion to save you, the viewer, from having to stare at a lawyer's face the entire time. <laughs> okay, here we go. All right, we've got our estate planning in the midst of COVID-19. Now, what happens if I become incapacitated? What is a guardianship? Well, a guardianship in Florida, it's a court supervised legal proceeding where a guardian is appointed to serve for and exercise the legal rights of an incapacitated person. Now, what does that mean in English? Uh, if there comes a time when you are incapacitated, you're not able to make decisions for yourself, then a court action would be filed and the court could appoint a person to be responsible for you and your things. Uh, Generally speaking, that would be a guardianship. Any adult in Florida can file a petition with a court to determine another person's incapacity. That court will determine whether or not the incapacitated person is able to manage at least some of their property or meet at least some of their essential health and safety requirements. Now, how the court does this is they appoint a three-member examining committee that uh, will report to the court on the incapacity of the alleged incapacitated person. And the court will also appoint an attorney for the ward. The ward is how uh, we refer to the incapacitated person. And that person is able to choose their own attorney. They can substitute their own attorney if they have one, um, but the court will appoint an attorney to represent the incapacitated, incapacitated person. And, uh, that person or an institution, it can be an institution, it doesn't necessarily need to be an individual, they're responsible for the care of that ward, of that incapacitated person and or their assets, their things. A lot of people, when we're talking about a guardianship, will ask the question, well, I don't you know, want anybody to be my guardian. Can I, can I pick, can I choose who will act as my guardian if I'm incapacitated or if I run into this kind of a situation? And you can. Uh, there is a, a document known as a Declaration of Pre-Need Guardian. This is something that anybody uh, can prepare, complete, 
and it gives the court instruction as to who you would like to serve as your guardian if you become incapacitated. And as long as that person is qualified to serve, and unless the court thinks it's not in your best interest or the incapacitated person's best interest, then that person should be named to act as the guardian. So the short answer to that question generally is yes, you are able to choose a guardian ahead of time if you become incapacitated. Now again, a lot of people when they hear um, guardianship, the word guardian or guardianship, they think about minor children. They think, you know, well, I don't have minor kids. I don't need to worry about that. My kids are grown. Um, but Again, it's not just for uh, not just for kids. It's for incapacitated people, as we've just spoken. Now, guardianship does apply to kids as well, though minor children. So, parents are typically the natural guardians of their children until they're gone or incapacitated themselves. Now, when uh, when a child's parents are deceased or incapacitated, then the court must appoint a guardian for the children. And parents, parents are able to designate guardians for their minor children, and they can do that in a number of ways. You can do that through your last will and testament, you could do that through a trust, or you can do that through a written declaration filed with the clerk of court. All right, so there's a few ways to, um, to prepare or handle how a guardianship would work if you have minor children. Going right along in my uh, question string, this is how I usually receive them. Um, someone would typically ask, ask next, are there least restrictive means in a guardianship? Do I have to have somebody, if I'm incapacitated, step in and take care of me and my, my assets uh, if I'm not able to? And there are, yes, there are, able to, are ways uh, that you are able to plan in a least a less restrictive way than to have a guardianship, all right? Um, and Florida requires that the least restrictive alternative um, be used if possible. So a person who has done the proper planning, taken the necessary steps, they may not require a guardian in the event of an incapacity, all right? If you've, if you've done uh, certain things, if you've done some planning, then you can avoid this kind of uh, proceeding. And guardianship proceedings are not usually quick and inexpensive. So there are, those are a couple of the reasons why people would, um, would like to avoid something like that or putting their family through something like that. So one of the things that we, uh, we talk about now to go directly from that topic, uh, what can we do to try to mitigate the necessity for a guardian? We go to a power of attorney. Now, a lot, of, a lot of people are familiar with a power of attorney. Um, I would say more folks are, from, are familiar with what a power of attorney is uh, as opposed to a guardianship or a guardianship proceeding. Power of attorney, legal document delegates authority from one person to another. It can be broad, it can be limited, it just depends on how the document's worded, okay? Um, if you wanna have somebody act for you, you can do that through a power of attorney. A principle. A principle is what we call the maker of the power of attorney. So somebody who wants to make a power of attorney and give authority to somebody else to handle things for them, they're the principal under that power of attorney, which leads us to the agent. The agent is the person who is given the power to act. If uh, you were to give your son the power to handle your affairs for you under a power of attorney, your son would be the agent, you would be the principal. Now, this is a question I've been getting a lot lately um, regarding powers of attorney uh, and other documents as well. People would like to know whether or not they need a witness or a notary um, when executing these kinds of documents. So specifically for a power of attorney, generally speaking, a Florida power of attorney has to be signed by the principal and two witnesses to the principal signature, so the maker. A notary must also acknowledge the principal signature. So we're gonna want two witnesses and a notary, okay? And we discussed last time how we're able to do these kinds of things while keeping socially distant. Um, we're getting creative and uh, we have signings in your car, we have porch signings. Uh, there are many ways that, uh, as I said, we've gotten creative to maintain safety protocol and keep socially distant. 
Now, there are a few different types of powers of attorney, okay? And uh, a limited power of attorney being one of them. What is a limited power of attorney? It's exactly how it sounds. It limits that agent's authority to specific acts. So for example, uh, you have a house in another state and you wanna have somebody sell it. You can give that person the power of attorney to sell that home. The power can be limited to just selling that home. So that person wouldn't be able to go take money out of your bank account or make medical or healthcare decisions on your behalf. That limited power of attorney would be limited to just that act of dealing with the sale of the home. General power of attorney. Again, uh, the title uh, speaks volumes. A general power of attorney typically gives the agent a very broad power. Um, however, the specific list of what they're able to do, their authority, has to be included in the document, okay? But a general, of course, is not limited. So it provides more power than a limited power of attorney would be, as the last example, where you just give somebody that power to deal with the sale of a home. Now, the problem sometimes when dealing with powers of attorney, particularly using power of, powers of attorney blindly, uh, unfortunately, people will say, oh, here's a power of attorney form, or I copied my dad, the one he used, and I just plugged my name in the part or I should uh, plug it in. Now, I'll tell you about a client, a uh, client who saw me and let me know um, I was doing some estate planning, but let me know that his son had already given to him a limited power of attorney. His son had been deployed, he was in the military, and before he left, he uh, he gave my client his uh, power of attorney, limited power of attorney, to deal with the sale, if necessary, or transfer of his classic Pontiac GTO. So my client dad had this power of attorney um, to deal with the GTO if need be. Uh, his son was trying to plan and be prudent, um, leaving and knowing that he was going to be in danger while he was gone. And unfortunately, uh, his son was injured overseas and um, was not conscious for some time. Uh, when he did regain his uh, consciousness, he was still very limited in his capacity, and it didn't look like he was ever going to be 100% again. Now, unfortunately, in this circumstance, that power of attorney that son had, had the foresight and planning to give to dad, my client, did not work. It failed. Um, reason being, powers of attorney, general regular powers of attorney, are not effective when you are dead or when you are incapacitated, unless you have what's known as a durable power of attorney. Now, a durable power of attorney remains effective even if a person becomes incapacitated. In England, they call them enduring powers of attorney. They endure, they keep going. Whereas uh, uh, the power of attorney in the situation that I, uh, I had spoken about previously, the, the limited power of attorney, it did not endure. It did not uh, continue after, after the son's incapacity. It, it ended, it ceased to operate, which unfortunately turned into a guardian proceeding that dad had to file to have son declared incapacitated and get guardianship um, over his person and his assets. Um, these are things obviously that both son and dad would have wanted to avoid. Now, the durable power of attorney, so long as it contains the appropriate language, will stay in effect, it will be valid, even when you are no longer um, able to make decisions for yourself. Okay, so very large distinction there. And again, it's the danger with blindly using powers of attorney and just plugging names in uh, where you think appropriate. You need to use the proper document for your circumstances. Um, out of state powers of attorney in Florida. Now this is a common question because of all of the transplants and snowbirds that we happen to have here in Florida. There are many people who say, well, Mr. Baldwin, I have my documents from uh, Massachusetts. I, I had my documents done 10 years ago in Virginia. I had my documents in Michigan. Um, a lot of people have powers of attorney 
that they had created in another state and then they relocated to Florida and they want to know if they can still use those documents here. So long as that power of attorney was properly executed under that other state's laws, it can be used in Florida. But the agent is only uh, allowed to act as authorized by Florida law and under the terms of that particular power of attorney. Now, Florida does have a few additional requirements, particularly with a power of attorney for real estate, real estate transactions. And if the document doesn't comply with those Florida requirements, then the power of attorney may be relegated to a more limited use than was originally intended. So it's always a good idea to uh, have somebody, an attorney, review your documents um, if you've relocated from another state, just to make sure that there aren't any issues. This is another common question, and people would like to know whether or not they can give a power of attorney to somebody else that only becomes effective when they're incapacitated. So people are concerned with giving somebody a power now while they're still well. You know, um, I guess it's, uh, it's, it's a understandable concern. You don't want to give power uh, to somebody to go in and clean out your bank account or sell your assets or things like that or have to worry about those things. And so you'd rather that they have that power when it's needed, when you're no longer able to make decisions for yourself. Now, unfortunately, a springing power of attorney is uh, what we call that. Uh, it's no longer valid in Florida. Springing powers of attorney were uh, powers of attorney, uh, as I said, they, they didn't come into effect until the incapacity happened, until a future date. But Florida doesn't recognize springing powers of attorney um, unless they were signed before the law changed. So they were executed before October 1st, 2011. It's a, a little different story, but after uh, October 1st, 2011, springing powers of attorney um, are not valid in Florida. You, uh, can't be created. So all powers of attorney here in Florida, they transfer power immediately. All right, you're giving somebody the power right upon their signature. Okay, but you are able to hold the power of attorney until the time is needed. So oftentimes a lawyer will be used for this role. You can leave the power of attorney with the lawyer who created the document with instructions to the lawyer to deliver it to the agent under certain conditions. Uh, if you become incapacitated, if the surgery doesn't turn out well, uh, whatever the case may be, you can leave that document with um, a trusted person, as I said, uh, typically a lawyer, and, and have that lawyer um, provide the document to the agent when the time comes. And uh, if you don't want that agent to be able to use the power of attorney, you should specify in your document that original copies should be uh, accepted because under Florida law, copies are sufficient for acceptance. Um, third parties are able to rely on copies of your power of attorney. Okay, so springing powers of attorney are no longer accepted, but there are some things you could do um, to be able to hold off, so to speak, a little bit on giving those powers and in terms of transferring the document that that agent can use. Okay. Now, what if somebody refuses to accept that power of attorney? I've had clients tell me that they went to the bank and the bank said, no way, we're not accepting that power of attorney. Um, it happens sometimes. If your power of attorney is lawfully executed, it's valid, not revoked, not suspended, terminated, then a third party can be forced to honor the document. That third party, if they refuse, they're required to give the agent a written explanation explaining their refusal, um, and it needs to be uh, presented within a reasonable time. If you're having issues with acceptance of a power of attorney or somebody accepting a power of attorney, uh, it's a good idea to consult with an attorney for any of their unreasonable delay or refusal. If it's an unreasonable delay or refusal that uh, causes damage, then that third party could potentially be liable for the damages um, that they have caused. So we talked about guardianship in the beginning and people understandably would like to avoid a guardianship proceeding or putting themselves or their family members through a guardianship proceeding. So can a power of attorney be used to avoid a guardianship proceeding? 
it can be. And you have to have the power of attorney executed prior to incapacity. Uh, an incapacitated person or a person who is not in control of the full control of their faculties is not able to execute a valid power of attorney. But so long as that power of attorney was executed prior to the incapacity, then it might not be necessary for a court to, a court to um, appoint a guardian over you. Um, if the agent already has all those needed powers, then it's likely not necessary that a guardianship proceeding go forward. And even if a guardianship uh, action is filed, a guardianship can still be avoided if um, the court understands or if it's brought to the court's attention that a durable power of attorney or some other instrument exists that is sufficient, that will take care of the needs, that is uh, less restrictive than a guardianship proceeding. Now, when you complete a power of attorney, a lot of folks would like to know, how does that power of attorney expire or terminate? Is it just out there forever and I've given this person authority to uh, work on my behalf, do things on my behalf, and I can't take it back? That's not the case. Uh, power of attorney expires, terminates in a few ways. If you die, again, a power of attorney is only a document that is alive while you are alive, alive or incapacitated, but upon your death, then the power of attorney is no longer a valid document. So upon your death, the power of attorney expires, it's terminated. It can also be terminated by you revoking your power of attorney. So if the principal revokes the power of attorney, um, it's no longer good. If a court determines incapacity, but does not specifically provide that the power of attorney is to remain in force, then it's terminated. Or the reason or the need for the power of attorney is ended. So uh, if uh, you gave the power of attorney to sell that particular home and the home was sold, the business is done, power of attorney is no longer needed. Now, the last one there, the term of the power of attorney expires. If you have an, a, a term in there um, that provides for, for expiration, then that will work to terminate the power of attorney as well. This gives a brief overview, a very brief overview of some of the incapacity planning that's part of estate planning. Again, last week we talked about the death portion of planning. Um, incapacity is a hot topic. Uh, it is something that I see great concern with, even though clients don't often know the proper terms um, or what, what, they're, what they're trying to ask. But it usually comes down to some kind of a concern with what they will put their family through should something happen, a common occurrence like an accident or a sickness, um, something like that where you're unexpectedly uh, not able to make decisions anymore. All right, so with that, I did receive some questions. I had some questions that were sent to me, um, which is why I chose to speak on this topic. Um, next week, we'll, we'll have some different topics in the realm of estate planning that will probably be to do with a little bit of both death planning as well as incapacity planning, okay? Um, but right now, we will go to our questions. Get rid of my screen here. And there we are. Okay. Um, I have a question here that asks, Okay, do I need a power of attorney if I have already added my son to my house and my bank account? Okay, now this is, um, this is something similar to what I addressed last week. And I never recommend just adding a name to a bank account or to a home any asset for that matter. Uh, because again, once you add somebody to an asset, a bank account, a piece of property, they're an owner, um, just like you. They're a part owner of that property. So if they wanna take money out of that bank account or if they um, have creditor problems or some situation like that, uh, you really uh, are putting some of those assets uh, to, in an unnecessary risk situation by just adding um, names to assets. 
uh, really utilization of a document like a power of attorney, like we talked about here today, uh, is typically the preferred course of giving somebody else access to those kinds of things or giving somebody else the ability to assist you or, or not have to go through arduous processes like probate or guardianship. All right, so there are more, um, in my opinion, effective means of handling these kinds of things that don't subject your assets to unnecessary risk. Okay, I hope that answers your question. Um, the next one I have here, do I need a will if I have a power of attorney or vice versa? Okay, well, we spoke about um, wills last week. And a will and a power of attorney are two very different documents that do two very different things. Um, again, a power of attorney is only, is only valid while you're alive, whereas a will is only valid when you're dead. Um, the two are in play at opposite times. Power of attorney, again, gives somebody the ability to um, handle your affairs for you, uh, step into your shoes, so to speak, in, um, whereas a will is instructions to a probate court as to how you would like to see your wishes carried out when you're gone. Um, and the point to a will there is so that you don't have to have your assets um, go through Florida's default plan uh, and testacy laws. So again, a power of attorney and a will are, are two very different things. Most of the time, uh, a person would have both. You would have a power of attorney that would assist with matters while you're still here or incapacitated. And then that will would be utilized once you're gone um, and it would provide instruction as to what you would like to see happen when you're no longer here, okay? Um, I hope that's clear. I hope that makes sense. Uh, let's see here. I have, the next question is, can I give two people, like my son and my daughter, a power of attorney over me? Well, that's the end of the question. Um, can, okay, so can I give uh, two people, my son and my daughter, a power of attorney? Florida law does allow you to name two or more people to act as co-agents under your power of attorney. So you can, you can name your son and your daughter and um, they're able to act independently. Uh, they're, they can exercise that authority independently unless your document says otherwise. If you would like for them to work jointly or if you would require that they would work jointly, um, you're able to do that. You're also able to name a successor. You can name a successor uh, who would step into the shoes of that agent should your agent be no longer able or willing to do so. Um, so yes, is the short answer to that uh, question. Florida law does provide for you to name um, two or more people as co-agents. All right, okay. Do I need to have a lawyer to get a power of attorney? Uh, you're not required to have a lawyer to uh, get a power of attorney. Anybody can draw up a power of attorney if they want to. I don't necessarily recommend that uh, somebody does that, but you are not required to um, see a lawyer. Now, when I got this question, uh, I actually had a sibling of mine, um, this wasn't a client, uh, send to me some samples that she had found on the internet and wanted to know if these are okay. Sample power of attorney form. Now, anybody can go online and type in on the search bar there, free Florida power of attorney or insert your jurisdiction here. And I'm sure you'll find numerous examples uh, to pull up and just plug your information in and go ahead and use. Now, I'm gonna share with you a couple here that my sibling brought to my attention and has asked me about. And uh, it, is a, it is a question uh, I've heard before, you know, can I just pull one of those, do it yourself off the internet uh, and do it myself? And of course you can, again, not necessarily advisable. Now, let's see here. I will show you. All right, here we go. Here's, here's one that, uh, the one we found the, on the internet and it, it's a very pretty form. Um, it looks very legal and official. It's got a nice border on it. Now, 
a few of the issues that I find when looking at this, we can see we have the person that's supposed to initial next to each one of these powers that they would like to give their agent. But we get to the last one here, and it says, all of the powers listed above, you don't need to initial any other lines if you just initial this one line. So they're saying it's kind of like initialing here is initialing everything. Now, the problem I have with this is that's not what Florida statute says. That's not what the law says. Uh, it says you need to initial next to the power that you want to be, that you would like to give your agent. And it doesn't say you can initial down to the bottom and then it makes everything okay. So I, I, I would be very cautious in utilizing a document like this because it doesn't necessarily abide by the uh, black letter of the law. If you look just a little bit below this, check this box and it applies to everything. You'll also see a bunch of blank lines right here. I don't like blank lines on a power of attorney and many people can guess why. Um, let's say I pull this document off here, I print it and uh, sign it and I wanna use it as a power of attorney. I give it to my agent to go off and do the things that I've asked for them to do. Well, who's to say that they can't just write in whatever they want in this little line here and how will the person, the third party that they're giving it to know any different? Again, I, I, it, 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 it's susceptible to tampering and fraud and, and I, I don't like that. So personally, there, there are a couple of things there that g give me pause, that bother me when I look at this, this form. Whereas it does look very pretty, uh, the content is not as pretty as it appears at first glance. My other problem I have here is if you look down here at the signature line, signed, dated, signature, your social security number, why are they asking you to list your social security number at the bottom of this document? I have no idea, it's not required. Um, and a power of attorney is a document that you're providing to third parties to handle business. Um, I don't necessarily advise giving out your social security number on a document, so willy-nilly. Um, but again, there's a, a few problems with this document. Uh, those, just being, those just being the few that I found in my cursory review of glancing down the page here. Now, I have another one here that uh, these were just some of the options that popped up in the Google search, you know, the first couple that popped up there. And here's the next one. Very similar. It looks very nice, um, very pretty form. Again, a lot of blank lines in here. Don't like the blank lines. This document does the same thing. You go all the way down, initial here, and it's like initialing everything. Not provided for in Florida law, so don't feel comfortable with that one. But they do that again. More blank lines. Fill in your powers or limit your powers here on these blank lines. Not a fan of that. Um, now, the part here that's different is at least they don't ask for the social security number. But Again, this is just a brief example of the couple forms that, will, that were pulled off of the internet that people use all the time. Um, just my two minute look at these things prop, popped up those problems that I have. So there is a danger with blindly using forms. Uh, we go back to my example with my client and his son and his Pontiac GTO. The blind use of forms. Um, a lot of the times the heart is in the right place, the planning is in the right place, and unfortunately all just falls flat on its face if it's done without the proper research and assistance, okay? Um, this was our brief little topic today on incapacity planning, guardianship and powers of attorney. Uh, I'm, I miss seeing clients face-to-face. -face. I miss doing presentations in person, um, but I do enjoy having another format to present information. So thank you for watching. I appreciate your comments. Um, please keep them coming, your questions. Uh, I can't get enough of those. So please keep commenting, commenting, keep asking your questions, and even when we're out and about again, back to 100% normal, uh, shaking hands and sitting at tables together, uh, I still like to keep this format. It makes these educational opportunities available to people who are, they don't get out so easily. And I've had a lot of clients who it's not easy for them to leave their homes.
So I appreciate, I enjoy this opportunity to give this information. Keep your questions coming, keep your comments coming. Um, I appreciate those as well. All right, uh, we have another round next week, Tuesday. Please go ahead, um, register if you're so inclined, ask your questions, and we'll address some more Florida information at that time. All right, everybody, have a good rest of your week, and I will talk to you next week.